You're watching Global Trade This Week with Pete Mento and Doug Draper. Welcome to another edition of Global Trade This Week. I am one of your hosts, Doug Draper. I'm out in the uh, great state of Colorado. My partner in crime with some crazy artwork behind him. I've never seen those pictures, the one on the your left shoulder. Really? It's my buddy, Pete Mento. Pete, how you doing? I'm doing great, Doug. How are you, buddy? I'm doing good. I'm doing good for uh, for a Monday, and uh, it's sunny, going to be low 80s here. Look at that. We opened the show on just a bunch of old men talking about the weather, so I will take responsibility for that. I'm not going to talk about it anymore. It's okay, man. I mean, we had a trash summer here. If it wasn't raining, it was like 105. It mm-hmm. was it was a really brutal time. And now I, I, I'll talk about it a little bit more later. I was up in Maine all weekend and um, a bunch of my friends who live in Texas and stuff didn't bring pants. They didn't bring trousers. <laughs> and at night it was like 40 something degrees. And like, don't you remember where we went to college? It, I mean, it was, it was yeah. beautiful. The skies were clear and everything, but man, it was cold as hell. So I think winter's going to be bad. It's going yeah. to be bad, dude. Bad. Bring it on. Bring it on. I love well, it. Yeah. Well, for you and Keenan, you get all fired up when you hear that because you're going to be skiing and everything. So, yeah. Yeah. It's never cold weather. It's just bad, uh, um, bad outfits and jackets. So, I guess. Anyway. All right, brother. Let's just get this sucker rolling. So, uh, I open. So, you're topic number one. Yeah. Well, um, Last week was pretty tough for custom sales brokers and freight forwarders everywhere because we were facing an impending government shutdown. And for for people who work primarily on the the customs and trade side, that gives us uh, a lot to worry about because the Department of Homeland Security and a lot of our partner government agencies were going to be faced with losing a lot of overtime and having the folks in the government that we work with have to come into work and not get paid, Doug. So... That was going to mean delays in a lot of shipments and problems with getting what had normally been routine processing done. Things like um, problems with FDA, issues with getting bonds approved, um, problems with fish and wildlife, and inspections being done timely, getting folks at customs to answer questions. Just things that we take for granted that happened because of people being available and things being available. Well, in the last minute, a uh, continuing resolution was passed, and there was a lot of political clout that had to be, I, I guess the best way to put it would be sacrificed mm-hmm. by leadership in the uh, GOP. And other parts of the Republican Party now have come out and said, you know, you've done screwed up now, man. Like, we're, we're coming for your chairmanship. And these continuing resolutions, they only last for 40 some odd days. We've only got 45 days left before they're going to have to go through this again. Normally, what, what's happening is, you know, it's a it's a it's a twelve part agreement that we're going to fund the government based on these these um, these twelve separate agreements, and um, the mandatory spending is already taken care of. This is the additional stuff, and it's things like funding what's going on in Ukraine, dealing with issues at the border because of um, just, just sort of the number of people that are coming across and the emergency issues there, trying to deal with um, problems that we're facing with the fentanyl crisis. Uh, You know, managing stuff that just comes up outside the course of the regular uh, government Mm -hmm. stuff that we see. So we could be managing these same problems again here in a little over a month. And uh, because of the divisiveness that we're currently seeing in D.C., I I just don't want people to get too comfortable. We could be going through all of this again in a little over a month again. The good news is, if you want to call it good news, I guess the comforting thing is we've seen it before. Mm -hmm. So we can tell you what to expect. And the trade community on our side of the of the the aisle, I think, did a pretty good job of letting everyone know here's what to expect. I don't think that most importers and exporters were letting everyone else in their organizations know. So we were telling everyone over the course of the past three weeks, get ready. Something terrible could happen. The good news is it didn't happen, but it still could happen again. So how Mm -hmm. about you take all that advice and all those warnings that happened over the last couple of weeks and let everyone know the sky didn't fall, but it still may very well fall. So let's Mm -hmm. get prepared for it if it does. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good point. I I can't remember. Um, There were so many LinkedIn posts from companies saying what happens if, right, which is great. That's good Mm -hmm. information that needs to be shared. And 
and everything. But the one thing that you mentioned is that we've seen this before and it's almost that we're numb to it, right? When, when I was talking to my wife, I'm like, they'll figure it out. And then just went around, what, what about our day? I just don't see how they can have a government shutdown in this day and age. I mean, if it does, it, I don't, I don't get it. Pete, it's just, it happens too much. The American people have become numb to it with the expectation yeah. that um, it'll get resolved. It'll get resolved literally in the final hour um, of what's going on. But the one thing related to our industry is that, um, like you said, 45 days from now, we're going to be kind of doing the same thing potentially. And hopefully companies that did a little bit of prep work now will be in a better position uh, in 45 days to say, don't let your guard down. It's not over. Uh, don't put the, uh, don't put your, um, uh, your plans on hold and, and put it away. I think, I mean, customs is customs. If there's no people there to push buttons and move paper, um, nothing's going to happen. So it, I don't know. It'll be interesting, but I think that that the the knowledge and the awareness and the preparation that happened that was not needed will be beneficial if it does happen in 45 days. But the bottom line is, my prediction, Pete, they're going to kick the can down the road. They'll get it. They don't want to upset during the holidays. Blah 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 blah. And it'll be sometime in first quarter. We'll have the same conversation. I I I, I like to think that they'll find a way to pull this all together, particularly with elections coming. Yeah. You know, and, and they don't want to continue to leave a sour taste in everybody's mouth. So we'll see. But I think there's going to be, if I had to bet on it, I think that there's going to be some some serious blood in the water when all this is over with. And both parties will do everything they can to embarrass one another. That's what they do. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we'll, we'll we'll see. But again, like you were just saying, like I was saying, everyone should take this as an opportunity to educate the folks they work with to say it's not over yet use this as a chance for us to prepare ourselves as this really does come down. Yeah. Yeah. What you got, Doug? All right, man. We've, we've talked about uh, this topic several times in different capacities, but um, Pete, if you don't look now, the U S is talking to everybody and their dog about trade agreements related to precious metals, lithium, nickel, and the likes that go into the EV batteries. So um, that, that is happening again with the, with the EU and, enhancing free trade agreements so the minerals that are used that are imported and the cars that are are uh, produced that's using minerals that are not based in the united states but they'll still get the ev credits and consumers will still buy it and everything else so um it, it just it it is interesting to see um, we did this with japan i think in first quarter of last year that basically reaffirmed that um, there's there's no barriers uh, of entry with with those products. It just shows that uh, lithium, nickel, the precious metals that are needed um, to to uh, build and manage um, the EV industry, where we are full bore forward, private public sectors uh, to make it happen. Um, so you're going to see um, uh, see that a lot. Specific. Uh, two things, Pete. Number one, um, Chile is the world's largest deposit of, of lithium out there. And we do have a free trade agreement, but you're going to see that on steroids because we want to make sure that there is no barriers in accessing uh, those raw materials from that part of the world. So I think you'll probably see something about that. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll clean up and adjust that trade agreement. Um but specific to us, Pete, is that the logistics industry, if you can't figure it out, uh, alternative energy logistics is going to be a big deal. And if there's companies that can figure it out, whether you're transporting it, importing it, warehousing it, um, as far as you know, raw materials and, and, and things of that nature, it's going to be big business. The one thing I realized, Pete, in the warehouse industry is uh, warehousing lithium batteries right? There's a company called uh, CATL in China that um, is one of the largest producers in the world. And uh, we had an experience, a personal experience where we needed to warehouse like 600 car batteries uh, for a production plant out in California. And I was like, yeah, just put them in the corner. We'll be good. Nope. Nope. I mean, you've seen lithium batteries, whether it's in electric bikes, electric cars, and you see Teslas that burn for days. 
uh, imagine the compliance required to bringing that many batteries in from a warehousing perspective. So um, there's opportunities there where there's a will, there's a way, and when there's a need um, that's compliant, timely, um, uh, there'll be companies that take advantage of it um, and develop verticals. I know they're already out there for big companies. I'm sure DSV has a whole vertical for alternative energy, but it's not going away. And I think there will be uh, uh, entities that um, and companies that embrace it. But it's funny that um, rules are important and trade agreements are trade agreements are important unless they no longer are uh, convenient or beneficial to what we're doing here in the United States. And so let's just change them and tweak them. So I think there will continually be news about changing, updating, or negotiating new uh, agreements with companies that have precious metals that we need to fuel our uh, electric uh, economy. So anyway, that caught my attention on the headlines the other day. We, we have, we've been working on that agreement with Chile for a while. We have political issues that are making it difficult for us to do that. We have issues with Europe that make it hard for us to get past our EV issues there. You know, we have demands about value content for USMCA and the battery making up most of the value of these cars makes it hard for yep. us to get past those. Um, we got to get out of our own way. We want to see more and more EVs um, on the road because of the way that we've set up these agreements and past those those political issues um, that get us where we desperately want to be there. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that as we begin to craft this new evolution of trade agreements, we begin to focus more on the idea of what we want them to look like in 50 years and not year one, two, and three, because as the evolution of trade and as this, this economy that we've been trying to build forever, which is based on innovation, stalls from the idea that America has just been leading all these new technologies. We leap to the next ones, which is exploring space, genetic therapies, all this new medicine. We should think like China does in 100 year leaps, not in two or three or four or five year leaps and protect mm -hmm. ourselves for what's coming next. We knew this EV thing was going to be a big deal 10, 15 years ago. We should have been preparing for it. Up, up until then. I don't really think that we were, bud. And that was a that was a missed opportunity. And then as far as freight forwarding companies preparing for it, I can only speak for DSV um, in the limited amount that I've been able to understand so far. We've been really working hard for a long time to create tailored large scale solutions to the point where we have, you know, air solutions with our own equipment. We have, we have relationships at significant airports where we've taken up our own space to be able to deliver goods outside of congested areas for the EV building community all over the world so that we can get them products because we just know we have to be there now in order for us to be at scale when it does get where it needs to be. But we're fortunate to be able to do that because of our size. I yeah. think that as people continue to invest, that's a place that if you want to be, like Gretzky said, be where the puck's going to be, not where the puck is. So get yourself in that position now so that when it does become a significant economic opportunity, you're already there, if you can. Yeah. Great, great analogy. I love it. Okay, we got a little halftime going on here. That's when Pete and I get to pontificate about anything that we want. It has nothing to do with our industry, or sometimes it does, but uh, it's brought to you by Cap Logistics. And uh, we want to thank them for giving us the platform. Every single week, it's always fun, and, and I'm glad that they uh, uh, they grant us um, that opportunity. So, Pete, I don't know. You want to yeah. go start? You had a hell of a weekend, so share it with the audience. Yeah, I, I got away this weekend. I went to Castine, Maine, where I, I did my undergrad at Maine Maritime Academy. And Maine Maritime Academy is a four-year university with a graduate school that focuses on degrees for people in direct into maritime industry. So people who want to uh, go to sea on ships, work in uh, container vessels, all vessels at sea, also to have careers in the US military. They also have a number of degrees in things like marine sciences, ocean sciences, and international business and logistics. They also um, have degrees for people on the engineering side for power. So whether that is folks that want to work at nuclear power plants, people that are going to be managing large engineering plants, shoreside. And when I was a young guy coming up back in 1980, it was um, 
it was a relatively small school that was challenging and not a lot of people made it through there. So not a lot of people applied. And it was a school for screw ups like me and the sons of lobster men who wanted to get their kids into a good school. But it has always graduated people, men and women into fantastic careers. It's always been a place where if you got through it, you're going to do pretty well for yourself. You worked half the year. Generally, you made significantly more than the national average. And in 20 years, you could retire and do very well. Um, over time, that's changed. I mean, there are less and less people that want to go to sea. There are fewer and fewer people, young people who want to really go into a very academically and physically rigorous university, just honestly. Uh, so the regiment of midshipmen makes up about 65% of the student body now, which is nice because there are actually women that go to school there now, frankly. Um, and there are an, a diversity of students now, um, which is good for a lot of different reasons. Not mm -hmm. the least of which you have differing opinions on campus, which is nice as well. But one thing hasn't changed. The students there are very bright and they're hardworking. And every day they work with their hands. They're wrenching on engines. They're, um, they're repairing things on vessels. They're getting dirty and wet and sweaty and miserable. Things break and they get to fix them. Things go desperately wrong and they have to find their way out of it. And it is a career preparing um, wonderful place where they teach you how to just deal with things going wrong. And it was my 30th reunion. Um, from what I can remember of it, it was magnificent, Doug. I, um, I did, I did drink a little more than I probably should have. Um, but the one thing I wanted to mention before I stopped talking about my school, it's really two things. I went to three different universities and, you know, pursued degrees and was fortunate enough to get them. Um, I'm not real proud of going to Harvard. Uh, a joke about it. You know, I, I, I constantly shit on that institution, Doug. You know, I, I, um, I'm, I'm proud of, of getting through it. I'm, I'm happy from the things I studied and I, I really liked most of my professors, but I wasn't impressed with the educational experience there. Uh, I'm so proud that I got the opportunity to go to that school, the sec, uh, to Maine Maritime. The second thing is my, my classmates have all been to a person wildly successful to a person. I, I was, I graduated with 122 midshipmen and I think 53 of them were there this weekend. Wow. It, that's yeah, cool. if, every single one of them has done well. Every single one of them. And now professionally, personally, I think like m most of them have been divorced, but nearly every single one of them has gone on to be a ship's master, a chief engineer in senior leadership in um, shoreside businesses, own their own very successful businesses, um, attorneys who are doing very well, people who have um, run for public office, individuals who have done exceptionally well in the US military receiving the highest ranks, um, just, just people who have led, who are pillars in their local communities that give of service. Just everyone has done very, very well. And I wanna think that's because from the time that we were teenagers, we just embraced the suck and learned to work in teams. And it, it made me happy to see. So um, shout out to that weird little place in the middle of nowhere on the coast of Maine that we all hated, but turned out to be a really good thing for all of us. Nice. Yeah, that's cool. You went there 30 years. That's a long time. So, mm. Yeah, no offense. I didn't mean it that way. The one thing that, that we can talk about at a different show, but I hear the creative writing classes at that school are phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, I think we took two humanities classes and a lot of technical writing. Yeah, but no, I'm sure. No, no, there wasn't a lot. You had um, you had 20 some odd credit hours a semester. So most Ooh. most schools were 12. So, you know, you were yeah. taking eight classes a semester and laboratories and you were, you, it, thank God you were so busy because there was nothing to do there. Mm -hmm. um, but they were all technical classes. Everyone got a bachelor of science. It was, yeah, there wasn't a whole lot of fun stuff, man. But if you want to learn how to weld or scuba dive or sail or, you know, paint, <laughs> it was, a, it was, a, it was a fun place to go to school, man. It was right nice. for me. I, I would not have made it very long in a traditional university. I, I lack the discipline and uh, I think the self-awareness to have made it. In retrospect, I'm very happy my mother submitted my application without my knowledge. 
in 1988. Nice. Well, mothers know best. Boy, do they ever. All right, brother. I uh, Something popped up last week. I was going to talk about it last week, but um, did you know that there's a private rail that just opened up that goes from Miami to Orlando, Florida? <laughs> Not until you told me this morning. I had absolutely nope. no idea. No clue. No clue. Nope. Um, I forget what it's called. I think it's the Bright uh, Brightline, B-R-I-G-H, uh, B-R-I-G-H-D line. And... Yeah, they're they're shuttling people from Miami to Orlando, Orlando to Miami. A couple of, um, you know, not, not uh, well. Miami is a gateway for sure, but they're just shuttling people up there for uh, for enjoyment um, as well. But I mean, no, I had no idea about it, right? And they're building one out on the West Coast that's going to connect Shocker, L.A., and Vegas, right? They're breaking ground sometime this this year, and they say it's going to be done in 2027, but. Um, some statistics on the bright line, right? So I, I'm going to read this because I don't want to make it um, um, make it uh, uh, wrong. So a round trip, right? Round trip ticket for one person, hundred and fifty eight dollars, right? It's it's not bad. It's about a three hour. It's less than a car, not dramatically less. Um, it can get up to like one hundred and twenty five miles an hour, right? Mm -hmm. And um, you can do business class for 158, first class for 298, um, and then there's group rates and all that kind of stuff. This is what blew me away, and I double checked this. They run 32 trains every day. Wow. 32. Now that's um, you know it, it, you know it could be 16 up and 16 back, but 32 trains a day on this private rail line that goes from Miami to Orlando that I've never heard of. And granted, I'm on the western part of the, of the U.S., but anyway, kudos. Like, there's some rail going on in California that's supposed to connect L.A. and San Francisco that's been going on literally forever. And I drive by uh, some of the construction, and I've been driving by it for eight months, and it looks exactly the way it's looked in the past. So kudos to the company that put Brightline together. It just shows that the private sector can move faster than the public sector. And it'll be interesting to see what transpires um, with the bright line west between LA and Vegas. So really quick, Pete, where would be the third place that you would put a rail here in the US? What two cities would you connect um, if they asked you, where's the third rail gonna be? That's really tough, buddy. You know, I, I don't know. I think those are probably the two best. Yeah. Because just the, the amount of tourist traffic that goes between the two of them. I have. No idea. I think yeah. Miami and Orlando was brilliant, and so is Vegas and LA. Yeah. You're just going to get people between maybe Dallas and Austin. I think would probably be the other great one, just because the yeah. number of people that go between the two. Yeah, yeah. Northeast, I don't see that happening brilliant. up there. Too congested. So you know, the number of people that want to see Disney World are you crazy? And now they've yeah. got two airports they can fly into, and the number of people that want to party and and um, vacation in Miami—that's just genius. Yeah. Yeah, cool. All right, let's hammer out this uh, this second half. So I don't know. You want to go first? Or you want me to? Yeah, mine's pretty easy, Doug. All right. So I'm in I'm in this fundraising speech where they're asking all of us to get our checkbooks out, and um, a president of the academy is talking about how there's this massive push to bring nuclear cargo ships as part of dealing with environmental issues, and so he he points out. Many of the military vessels around the world right now use nuclear boilers, and they are incredibly safe and effective and you know you pretty much fuel it once for the life of the vessel and environmentally they they're a home run you know and he, you know so he's talking to a super friendly audience let's get that straight right now i mean most yeah. of the people in the room are former navy officers you know a lot of them are let's to put it lightly pretty right wing people from northern maine that have done very well and hate taxes you could read between the lines you know <laughs> and um and i'm in the back and he makes this comment where he says you get a lot of folks that protest it that are of the bearded sandal wearing variety and i look at myself and i'm like bearded I look down I'm like yep yeah, sure enough birkenstocks and i didn't raise my hand and start a stink or anything but i can understand where he's coming from the thing is though i am painfully pro-nuclear i just i'm wondering is the world ready doug for for nuclear container ships and is is the world ready to the point where are we going to see little reactors going all over the world and people being cool with that popping in and out of ports all over the place 
I don't know, dude. Like, I mean, I, I like where your head's at, man, but you know, I got a lot of friends that are like nuclear. No, no matter what. And I don't know, Doug, what do you think? Well, first it's probably the next script for, uh, <clears throat> Tom Cruise's, um, Mission, Mission Impossible, Impossible movie, right? Yeah. Yep. He's got to save mm-hmm. some subs. And, you know, it's been around for a long time. And I think people, when they hear nuclear sub, right, people have heard that ter- uh, um, term, is they think it may be the ammunition in the in the, the military might, not necessarily it's being powered Often by are. nuclear. Both. So it's just, yeah. they got to, they, whoever they is, you know, the messaging has to be pivoted because people still remember Chernobyl and the other nuclear reactor implosions, right? And, and and people are scared and not understanding all that. I think that's a good solution. I think the more we talk about it, the more people will feel at ease. But it's all about messaging and and how do you pivot away and, and have people understand it's, it, it, it's not as dangerous as the perception is out there. And until that is broken down and that barrier is removed, it's still going to be a hard, a hard sell. For Maybe. The, I don't know. You want to power these EVs, buddy? Build a bunch of nuclear power plants. That'll yes. make it a lot easier. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. But exactly. I mean, you want to get my friends all fired up, have them start throwing bong water on each other, start talking about building nuclear power plants. They get all fired up. They get all kinds of angry. <laughs> nice. anyway, Doug, bring it home, brother. What you got for us? All right. Mine's pretty quick. And um, it was something I read just this morning. Right. So my my take on this is that 2024 is going to be the year of the small parcel wars, right? And the beneficiary of that is going to be companies and the end consumer. And the reason I say that is the article I read is that UPS, in an effort to gain back business they lost when people were preparing for their strike earlier this year, is they are essentially offering rebates or concessions to pay for penalties that companies will incur because they went to um, FedEx or another carrier um, and said, okay, we'll help you out. UPS is about to have a strike. We'll help you out. You got to sign this contract and you have to have a long-term commitment. So if you break that commitment and go back to UPS, and I don't know the proof statement or what you have to generate, but UPS is saying, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll help offset those costs for you to, to come back. So they're trying to pull the business away. FedEx is saying, hey, we just got this business. We're not going to let you go. We're going to emphasize this contract or we'll give you a discount. We want you back. So there's going to be this ebb and flow of these two powerhouses uh, trying to gain market share and customer base. And that is going to be the uh, the, uh, the consumer and companies that use high volume uh, parcel. They're going to be the beneficiaries. So you better get ready. There's going to be some uh, some epic battles between Beale Street and Hot Lana coming up. And I'm glad to say that I personally believe there will be benefit uh, for users and consumers of parcel shipping. So that's my prediction for 2024 as parcel goes. I'm with you, buddy. And I'm with you. Uh, I read that same article and I'm, I'm going through it. And I'm like, man, can you imagine being a sales guy? It's going to be like, yeah, come back home. You know, I mean, <laughs> hey. You know, we're, we're sorry about all the, all the all the drama over here. You know, it happens. But uh, yeah. hey, if you come back, we'll give you the money that these guys are going to charge you for breaking your contract. But then yeah. if I'm FedEx, I'll just be like, you know what? We do what we had to do. Just kidding. Um, you know, hey, you know, we'll, we'll drop that. We'll drop that. And, and, and we've got some some rates here. But you don't want to be a you know, you don't be the kind of person that puts a contract together. Then you're seen as someone who doesn't doesn't create it so yeah i think this is going to be a pretty wild time to be dealing with the small parcel folks it's not that different from people that were trying to pry containers away from the ocean carriers just yeah. recently and all the back and forth that was going on there i'm just happy i don't have to be a part of it so um i guess we're gonna have a good time watching it all doug yeah for sure for yeah. sure all right well that's gonna do it for us this week on global trade this week brought to you by our friends at cap logistics to learn more check them out at caplogistics.com don't cry doug and i'll be back again next week with Tina behind yes. the board for another edition of global trade this week thank you all as always for listening and for watching tell all your friends and subscribe and we'll see you again next week thanks doug excellent thanks Pete. Bye, everybody see everybody